This lecture is designed for undergraduate students and we'll be talking about dental crowding. Now crowding affects approximately 60% of Caucasians. Both jaw size and tooth size are mainly genetically determined and appear to be reducing in size. However, environmental factors, for example, premature deciduous tooth loss can also increase crowding. Now, in evolutionary terms, both jaw size and tooth size appear to be reducing. However, crowding is more prevalent in modern population than it was in prehistoric times. This may be due to that the introduction of less abrasive diet so that there's less interproximal tooth wear occurring during the life of an individual. This is supported by the fact that the change from rural lifestyle to urban lifestyle has been shown to increase the amount of crowding after two generations. Now classification of crowding. Considering the amount of crowding, crowding can be classified as mild when there's 0 to 4 mm need, moderate when it's 5 to 8 mm need, and severe where there's more than 8 mm of crowding. From an etiological point of view, we can classify it as primary, secondary, and tertiary. Now, primary crowding is a hereditary type of crowding and it's determined genetically and is caused by disproportionate sized teeth and jaws, meaning larger teeth than the jaws. The malalignment of the anterior teeth is characteristic of this type of crowding. Now, secondary crowding, it's an acquired anomaly caused by mesial drift of the molars as a cause of premature loss of deciduous teeth. Tertiary crowding, on the other hand, occurs between the ages of 18 to 20, primarily in the lower anterior segment. It may be attributed to several factors, like mesial migration, incisor uprightening, soft tissue, and intercanine width. Regarding mesial migration of the posterior teeth owing to forces from the eruption of the third molars, this has a weak relation with the development of late lower anterior crowding. Furthermore, crowding can still develop in patients with congenitally missing third molars. Therefore, the prophylactic removal of these third molars, if it's asymptomatic, cannot be justified. Uprightening of the lower incisors as a result of forward growth of the mandible when maxillary growth has slowed is maybe a contributing factor. Soft tissue pressure being stronger from the lips and cheeks than from the tongue at this age also can contribute to the development of crowding. Reduction in lower intercanine width in most individuals, canine width increases to around 12 to 13 years of age, and this is followed by a very gradual reduction of this size until late adulthood. This decrease is mostly seen in the mid and late teens. Now there are several space creation methods. The amount of space that will be created during treatment can be assessed. The aim is to balance the space required with the space created. Space can be created by one of the following methods. Derotating teeth. Actually, derotating incisors does not contribute to space creation because derotating interior teeth needs space because rotated incisors take up less space than aligned ones. While on the other hand, derotating molars and premolars contributes to space because rotated molars take up more space than aligned ones. So you frequently see appliances to derotate molars early in treatment. Uprightening incisors create space 
because medially tipped or distally tipped up incisors, they take up more space than upright ones. Distal movement of the molars in the upper arch can be achieved with headgear. Extraoral traction using headgear will produce up to 2 to 3 mm per side, meaning a total of 4 to 6 mm for total arch length. And this can be useful when there is a mild case of crowding where extractions are not indicated or in severe cases of crowding in addition to extractions. There are a variety of intraoral appliances that make use of screws or springs and acrylic buttons to distalize molars as well. However, nowadays temporary anchorage devices offer an alternative to headgear Appliances attached to these anchorage devices can be used to distalize the upper molars. Distal movement of the lower molars, however, is very difficult and is in reality the best that can be achieved is to just upright the molar and bring the roots forward rather than the crown distally. Expansion Space can be created by expanding the upper arch laterally. Expansion should ideally only be undertaken when there's a crossbite. Expansion without a crossbite may increase the risk of instability or perforation of the buccal plate. Several designs of appliances can be used for expansion and approximately 0.5 mm of space is gained for each 1 mm of posterior arch expansion. Expansion on the lower arch may be indicated if there is a lingual crossbite or a scissor bite of the lower premolars and molars. However, any significant expansion in the lower arch, particularly the lower intercanine width, is unstable. Now, proclination of incisors. Space can be created by proclining incisors but this will be dictated by the aims of the treatment. So proclining upper incisors in class 3 malocclusion and lower incisors in class 2 malocclusion can help correct the incisor relationship and relief crowding at the same time. For each millimeter of incisor advancement, you get 2 millimeters of space creation within the dental arch. <laughs> now for enamel stripping, Enamel interproximal reduction or stripping is the removal of small amounts of enamel on the mesial and distal aspects of the teeth. In addition to creating the space, the process can improve the shape of the teeth, the contact points of the teeth, and possibly enhance the stability at the end of treatment. On the anterior teeth, approximately half a millimeter can be removed on each tooth, being a quarter of a millimeter on the mesial and a quarter of a millimeter on the distal side, without compromising the health of the teeth. Enamel can be carefully removed with an abrasive strip, then treated topically with fluoride. A high-speed air turbine handpiece can be used to remove enamel from the posterior teeth. However, both teeth and periodontium can be damaged unless care is taken. Removal of filling material is preferred over sound enamel when applicable. It is important to realize that reduction of enamel should be done after aligning these teeth because it's very difficult to reduce the enamel in these crowded areas. Unless they, some areas are already aligned you can reduce these areas and as alignment progresses then you reduce the other areas the final method of space creation is extraction and before planning extraction of any permanent teeth it is essential to ensure that all the remaining teeth are present and developing appropriately i hope you found this lecture interesting I have several other lectures in the uh, YouTube channel and I've arranged them into playlists as orthodontic biomechanics, undergraduate orthodontics, postgraduate orthodontics and TAD workshop and I hope you can go through them 
and see anyone which is of interest. If you have any comments, please write them in the comment section and I would be happy to answer them. If you found this video uh, interesting, please give it a thumbs up, share it with friends, and you can subscribe to the channel from here. You can press the bell icon so that it notifies you whenever we upload a new video. This is the playlist for the whole biomechanics uh, lectures. And this is the latest biomechanical lecture that uh, has been uploaded recently. Thank you for listening.